So actually, Hamid, uh, I always, always wanted to know how did how did you end up getting into this form of uh, expression? Starting by being a director, this is a huge jump coming into shadow puppetry and especially focusing on on the Shahnameh. Just yeah, yeah very briefly, um, it's been a quite a journey. It's been fifteen years that I've been kind of dedicated myself to the stories of the Shahnameh and presenting these uh, epic stories uh, with the various different forms uh, to the general public. Because usually, especially Shahnameh outside of the Iran, it's very much elitist, it uh, belongs to high eyebrow sort, of, uh, sort of academia. So I was trying to break it and bring these stories into um, presented to the just common layback people and trying to avoid to go through academia. So the first things I did, and one of my motive was actually, was trying to create a um, content that talks about the highlight of the culture. Because in America, especially in the West, you know, you what you hear about Iran or that part of the world is always uh, negative. And um, so I was, since we are in the World uh, Music Institute, I will make this allegory that uh, Iran is like a symphony that you only hear one note from that old assembly of the instruments. So I, with this body of work, I try to create another sort of instrument and some different kind of sound into this orchestra. So what we, and I thought the highlight of our culture is the visual, our visual culture and our literature, something that we can be very proud of. Um, so as an immigrant, also when you travel outside of Iran, you really cannot travel with your civilization, but you can travel with your, uh, your culture. So that's what it sort of motivated me to create uh, the Shahnama project. Uh, and uh, from May of 2009, I just sat down in this corner <laughs> until now. And we have created uh, nine projects and we have two more projects that's coming up next year and the year following that. And so we start from the book, which actually I'm gonna show you some of the stuff that for the audience that they are not familiar uh, with this. I'm just gonna go show you some of and the images on the website. So you have actually um, get to, okay. So this is the book, the Shahnameh book, which is the, as a, I collected and put together um, over 8,000 miniature and lithograph um, from, um, uh, from late 14th century to mid 19th century, anything influenced by Persian painting. And I re-illustrated it. And also going back, I think I should explain what is Shahnameh means actually, as what it is, what is Shahnameh for those of you who don't know. Shahnameh is the longest poem written by a single poet um, in 1010, a poet named Ferdowsi, after 30 years of dedication, he, uh, he collect and put together millennium old epic tradition of uh, Iranian plateaus uh, into close to 60,000 heroic verses. This is equivalent, I mean, much larger, like sevenfold larger than Iliad and Odyssey. But this is in the, like the, like Iliad and Odyssey, you have a tragedies, love stories, battles, betrayal, and many share humanity that we all sort of familiar with like a forgiveness, revenge, um, uh, these kind of things. So the book was very successful to these days, we are in the ninth printing, in fact, uh, it's funny to know, I, according to my publisher, we are uh, top five best-selling book in its price category. We are basically competing with the Sex Book of Madonna and the Red Book of Carl Jung. <laughs> so I'm sitting between Madonna and Jung. <laughs> so it's a good place to sit. So based on that book, and then we create the, the audio book version of uh, the, the text, which is a 12 hours of... Um, a radio play with a fully sound design and sound effect and uh, with 61 voices. Uh, and then based after, after that, we created the small puppet show, uh, Zahok, which you can see here. 
and then we create the pop-up pop-up book, which was very successful again. And then we created uh, another pop-up book. We did a concert for Yo Yo Ma's band, uh, Silk Road Ensemble, and many of these things. And and recently we released uh, Rostam, another pop-up book we just finished. And last year we did Song of the North, which is uh, the topic of our conversation. So this is a of fifteen years of. Um, uh, dedication to create uh, this body of work. Uh, it's probably is the largest cultural um, uh, project that has been done since the revolution outside of Iran. I don't know what in Iran, but uh, the amount of work has been created around Shahnameh last 15 years is just uh, uh, just fantastic. <laughs> so let me uh, so. And for, for the first work that we did together, Ramin, was the Feathers of Fire, which we are sort of uh, created from the 160 puppets and 137 animated backgrounds. And we worked together uh, to create this full score for, for the uh, Feathers of Fire. But after Feathers of Fire, I just learned the technique and how I can push it and make it into a more uh, sophisticated project. So in this show, I'm going to show you shortly, we designed uh, close to 500 puppets and we have nine actors. We have over, uh, we have exactly 208 animated backgrounds and uh, it's 80 minutes uh, kind of extravaganza um, to go to, uh, to tell the story of the, one of the love stories from the Shah Nome, uh, which is the love story of Bijan Manji. So I think I answered briefly what you just asked me. <laughs> it's a lot of work, so I have to be very precise and you know go for it. So uh, yeah, this is the sort of how I got into this project, which is my motivation was totally actually a political, but I create something that doesn't talk about politics, but it has a political effect. We were like a feathers of fire. We we perform 112 times to over 100,000 audience, um, and it's uh, it's it's a it's a it's the most watched puppet show in America after Lion King. And but why did you choose shadow puppetry? Because uh, it goes back to my filmmaking background. Because uh, before Shah Nama project comes to place, I used to make movies. I made five films. And also I'm a graphic designer by training. And I also, I'm a craftsman. I make a lot of things by my hand. So I thought it would be uh, shadow theater is the place that uh, graphic design, uh, I was making a joke that graphic design meets cinema in shadows. So, <laughs> so I thought shadow theater would be a, a, a very good candidate uh, to collect all the skills I have in one place. Uh, I learned the first technique, you know, the first one I did, and I was kind of inspired by the work of Loti Reiniger, uh, a filmmaker who made the longest, uh, the first feature length animation in 1920s, 25, uh, before Disney, before anybody else was doing this kind of thing. So she made this fantastic uh, project called The Adventure of Prince Ahmad, uh, I recommend anybody who would like to interested go. Watch. Actually, there's a new, there's a new version of that on on YouTube. Very good quality. You should watch it. In 1925. So that was my motivation, and then I learned the work of Larry Reed, and I uh, learned some techniques like mask technique from him, and um, and I sort of pushed the push that technique to the different level. Uh, I add animation into it. I add the, the digital, I may digitize uh, the technique. I add uh, different layers of um, work, as I said, animation, uh, the colors. And, uh, I, and also we come up with this idea of like creating dowser for the lights, things like that to make it more cinematic. So basically create a live cinema because the audience, what they see, uh, I'm gonna stop sharing here. Audience, what they see, they see um, animation. They don't see a, a live theater, but in the backstage, we are actually making the animation. You so, wanna give an example? Do you wanna show something? Yeah, 
I want to show you guys the, the first, uh, the promo I made. And then after that, I'm going to show you how we made it. And then I'm going to go in details technically, and then we can talk about also the, the music composition uh, of the, the project. So uh, I think if I can, F, F, yeah, here we go. This is just uh, 55 seconds. <laughs> so now I want to show you um, now how we did. I'm going to close down the, um, I'm not, I'm not going to bore you guys with a lot of technical stuff, but I'm going to close down this audio here and just show you. This is our backstage. When you come to the theater, you don't see us like that. You see the other side, basically audience seats the other side. This is our stage. So in this stage, we have two sorts of light that we can cut switch one to another. Basically we have two sets of stage running at the same time. One in the left, one in the right. It depends what kind of light it goes. So you basically, you see the reflection. This is requires a lot of technical calculation that the shadows, they don't uh, sort of uh, overlap to each other from one light to another one. But as you can see, I uh, mean, we cannot see if we are on the, on ju uh, just on the logo. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, shoot. Okay. Let me see. Let me, let, let's do, let me do it again. Can you see now? Yes. Okay. Let me, let me, I was just talking about over these. <laughs> you should have told me earlier. <laughs> I didn't want to interrupt you. <laughs> so, yeah, this is our backstage, which, as I mentioned just earlier, you don't see this. You only see the front stage, and uh, which is the other side. So this is a, our a rehearsal space uh, somewhere in Queens, and. Um, as like as you can see, some of the uh, some of the cast member wearing these kind of masks, and I'm gonna tell you shortly how this mask actually design, and uh, and and then we have a very deep stage, almost uh, thirty feet, so you you are be able to create a small shadow and uh, depends on your location to the in accordance to the light. Uh, you can create the huge shadow or small shadows. So at the same time, as I mentioned before, we have two stages running at the same simultaneously, one for the uh, light on the right, one for the light on the left. So, and there is a tedious calculation, how actually you sort of calculate these things so they don't cast shadow to each other. So when they see right now, like when they switch to different lights, you don't even, uh, you don't see the shadow of the uh, uh, the stage, for instance, on the right. So the other thing is, uh, let's, let me talk about, these are technical stuff, uh, but the first of all, we perform in the pitch black. This is just lit up because I want to sh shoot, shot some movies so we can see it. But when we perform, there is no light in the backstage except our source of light. Um, what else? Yeah, let me also briefly talk about, uh, actually it's not briefly, I'm gonna extendedly talk about this, <laughs> about the design of the show. This is very important because uh, what I tried to do last 15 years with the first show, the pop-up book, the, the, the shows, everything I've done is to promote uh, the visual culture of the Persianites. Uh, so Persianite, what I'm saying is like also, uh, Mm, goes to India, Central Asia, Iran. You basically go to the Balkan. The, the parts that the, 
let me stop here and let me go to here actually now. Okay. Uh, so th this area of uh, geographical area uh, that I'm saying from the India to Balkan region, it's, uh, it's heavily influenced by different schools of painting uh, from Iran, like from the Tabriz, from Isfahan, from Shiraz, from Harat. These are the, the uh, schools of painting that influence Mughal India, Ottoman Empire, you know, they're all basically, uh, basically fitted by the, what's happening, uh, what's developed in this, in Iran. So I collect, for my first two, I collect together this visual culture in the course of four years. That was over 11,000 hours of uh, work. And based on that, these are now uh, sort of became source of inspiration for all the upcoming projects. So let me, uh, first of all, this is the size of the screen that we have. And if you see this, so it's quite large. It's 35 feet by uh, 15 feet tall and special kind of fabric that actually doesn't, uh, I had only less than a one step drop of light from the back, back projection to the front. It's not just regular uh, screen. So um, let me go here. These are some of the sample of the design for the puppets and characters. And these puppets comes to the sort of um, play like that, you know, like, as you can see the, the, um, the ensemble are, according to the scene, they are playing with these puppets. And these puppets are built, uh, I mean, we have to, first of all, uh, you know, design the color, and then based on that, you cut the puppets, and then you piece by piece uh, actually put them together. I have one example here, which I'm going to show you shortly how these puppets became uh, colorful. And also, this is three years of production. This is not just happening in the weekend and you go and perform. This is exactly the moment that I started, uh, the moment that we uh, premiered, it took three years. And, and in the parentheses, uh, pandemic really didn't affect us because the way that we actually work is like we're always in pandemic. We're always in the house <laughs> working in the studio. We don't leave the house. So on the right side, these are the design of the, um, these are design of the masks. So these are like, this is a princess managing in two different states according to the different part of the story. This is Bijan again in the different, in the three different states. Uh, this is Gorgin, this is Afrasiyah, this is Gord. This is Rostam here, uh, which you can see. These are uh, all, as you can see, these are like the inspiration for the heads uh, uh, here as a wealthy merchant. When he, in the story, he goes in the cognito, it's inspired from the, some uh, Mughal Indian uh, design. Or, or the beer is designed from the Akkadian, uh, you know, like a Persepolis. You can see, you know, each one it comes from the, uh, the inspired from somewhere. It's not just me sitting at. I like to make the face like that. This are has a historical reference. Everything. Um, so, and then based on that, we uh, dress the uh, dress the actors. So the actors wearing these masks. And, uh, and then you can see also some of the, the puppets that has been designed here. And, and also the costumes, which is a lot of costumes in this show, which is that's really actually quite the daunting task to change costumes on spots. There is actually a one part that Bijan goes to the journey. Uh, he, uh, when, we, when I wrote the script, actually I calculated, so we need like 40, less than a 40 second to change the clothes and comes out. So I calculate something so Gorgin can, another character can talk to himself. So why we give space uh, to Gorgin to change, Bijan to change the um, uh, clothes. So these are, and then should I keep going or you have anything to add into it? Oh, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I think one of the things that because I'm very familiar with the show so I'm kind of going to guide you through it I mean the, that's really great that you explained 
but I think we have we are like uh, 27 minutes into it already. Do you want to quickly talk about this, the the way that you actually uh, sequence these in uh, in in creation? Yes, yes. Where do you, so, where do you, how did it come? Because that's that's how it uh, was one of the biggest challenges. Yes. So let's start from here. Actually, we are in a good place. This is a book of the Song of the North that I made and based on that. So the first step for everything is creation of the story. So first you write the story and based on the story, you design the characters. And once you have the characters, you basically storyboard it. So here, as you can see, let me let me show you. This is the, let me go back slightly. Uh, this is the storyboard of the show, which I, right now in this book, I mix it with some of the images. But once, you, like this is all the storyboard. So basically you map up the entire show piece by piece. Here, in this case, we have 350 uh, some, some change <laughs> images that tells you exactly what's happening in any given time in the story. And based on that, you go create... Um, uh, backgrounds, you create the animation, you build all the mechanics of the show. And when it's finished, you basically bring uh, uh, bring and make the, let me see if I have it here. Um, uh, let me go here. I actually, I think I prepared one. You put it in the timeline in the Adobe Premiere in my case, and you, here we go. This is all offline, but this is the entire show. So you, you design the show like this, this is everything offline and you calculate is the right stage left stage right stage left stage right stage, and then you go for it and then based on this you design the sound and once it's finished i come to you <laughs> this is what i gave you so i say okay these are what we want and there is also there is like a like a doors there is a lot of hinges around so because we can just run the show forever and then at the, um, uh, actors run after the show because there is a Q lab involved. There is something that you have. There is actually over 2000 cues in these shows uh, that's performed. So uh, we talk how we can some part, we can stop the music so we can actually at some part, basically there are hinge in the story. Uh, so you can actually, uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, adjust the speed of the sound and music and acting together. For the following scene, so um, I'm gonna. Uh, what what we we heard a little bit of the music from the uh, from the uh, promo, and uh, I'm gonna give you one 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 note, and then I'm gonna pass the mic to you, Ramin. Uh, what for me again? What we are talking about? We wanted to create something purely. Um, Iranian. Uh, nothing comes from the Western audience. So we have the same approach to create some kind of urbanized Persian music, something that is um, uh, accessible for the 21st century audience uh, and also would be also based and sits on the foundation of the Persian music. So Roman can explain more on this. Um, issue actually i have to say it's this has been really an enjoyable conversation so far hamid i learned some stuff that i had not known before so <laughs> it's always good <laughs> to review and have a chat after a long time but i would say actually from the musical perspective uh, you know i'm kind of very familiar writing scores for films and animation and video game but the challenge for this project is that actually when we are composing and we are wor I'm working with Hamid, there are no actors. Uh, basically, you cannot kind of lock into an emotion of emotion of an actor uh, because that comes later on live on stage. So how do we go about that? How do we create an arch or moments of intent and punctuate sections without having actors? Uh, and it's not like a theatrical piece where the sound, it becomes more about a kind of a, 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 a sonic uh, scape or just a, the ambient sound. It's really there are moments of intent, there are choreographed done to, uh, to music. So that was the biggest challenge of trying to 
kind of created in such a way that if they don't hit it at this exact moment, still the music is forgiving and it doesn't look like they are off. This was actually quite challenging and interesting to work. And I think it took us a while to kind of get a handle on that between Hamid and I of how to go about that to get it done. From the architectural perspective of the music, that was the most challenging part. The rest is just creating uh, enough lush sounds that it is, as uh, Hamid said, it, is, it was both had the ethnic and authentic elements within it so that it contextualizes the story well, but it's orchestrated so that it has the big sound like a movie. So when you're watching, you want to feel after a while that you kind of forget this is happening live. It almost becomes like a real time animation. So the music had to create that as well. Like feel like, you know what, you are watching a movie and then go back and have these ethnic elements uh, that would kind of support and contextualize the, the, the vision that Hamid was uh, creating. Yeah. So I think uh, I would say we used a lot of, I mean, I, I performed a lot of different instruments on it, but we ended up using a lot of percussion. Hejman Haddadi was the who's a virtuoso percussionist, uh, worked on it. Mahsa Qasemi was an amazing Iranian cellist. Uh, she performed on it. I mean, the list goes on, but uh, it, it at the end, it came out to be a, quite a nice uh, body of work that I'm, I'm very proud of. Yeah, and also the, I'm going to show you a little bit uh, as a bonus. The, I have um, uh, the address rehearsal. Um, I forgot. Above all, my wife Azam Ali, who has a magical voice, and yeah. she. See, voice this is what what you were going to say. Actually, in the last production we did, Feathers of Fire. I mean, this production I learned more, so I give you more cues. The last production, basically, I give Roman White. I just give them timing. Okay, for this timing, I want this. <laughs> and and uh, this is the emotion. And this is some of the dialogue. Go make it. <laughs> yeah, the, and the also, yes, uh, uh, the first production, the voices, uh, Azam was very integral. And this production, uh, I mean, actually, voice is very important. It's the song of the North. So because the character is sings, the manager. So I'm going to actually show you guys uh, a very brief um, moments of the show um, and not revealing anything because you have to come and see it in mid-March. <laughs> but I'm going to show you a bit of the uh, show. Uh, let me see if I can find. Uh, let me go to my. Uh, where was uh, it's here. Chrome. Here we go. Let's go to desktop. Okay, let me go. Here we go. Can you see it? Hello? Yes, we can. Okay. You would go be go to the pit oh, no. and wait for me. My father will move with the great king. Let me go a little bit. Suit. I know how to stop them. You this is the, the middle of the show. Now, give me up. So one hour into the show. I will come with you, my lady. Rostam is equal to the task of rescuing Bajan. Fine, you come with me. First, let us get rid of these disguises and prepare for battle. Once I ride my steed, Ranch, no one can stand in my way. too much into it 
but I just want to give you a little bit of a teaser uh, that how it works. In fact, let me show you. I think I ha oh, I have what you just saw. I have the backstage. So let's watch this one. This is actually fun. So what you just saw. Three mountains. Let me see. Go, and let me see what. I know how to stop. So this is the you backstage. And rescue be down now. Give me a horse. I will come with you, my lady. Rest that meant equal to the task of rescuing Bajan. Fine, you come with me. First, let us get rid of these disguises and prepare for battle. Once I ride my steed, rash, no one can stand in my way. Puppets here. There are too many of them. What can we do now? Ride your horse down to deserve attention. Have them chase you back this way. Then get out of the way and hold your ears. I will take care of this army. My lady, I don't think that's a good idea. I know what I am doing. Go. Oh. Hey, hey, this way. Hello. Anyway. So, yeah, you, you, you got the idea how it works. So, um, and you see the, the, the grandeur of the, also the music, which is really amazing. Thank you, Ramin, again. <laughs> Always a pleasure working with you, Hamid. I think we yeah, should all have any questions. Of, huh? Go ahead. What were you going to say? No, I'm just saying that well, I have to uh, say one of the most pleasurable I mean, for the Feathers of Fire, it was the most pleasurable part of the project was working with Ramin. This is the same. It's just like we have such a harmony together and our taste is very much, uh, very much tuned. And we don't, uh, we don't, um, what do you call it? Uh, um, we really understand each other. And also, I, I'm also coming very prepared. You know, I have a lot of materials for each scenes, and we have a very good understanding how it, it works together. And, uh, and re the result is uh, always very satisfying, actually. The collaboration, the process, and also the outcome. So thank you. Thank you. So let's see if people have questions, and let's jump in. So. Should I read the questions? Well, there are plenty of questions. <laughs> we have, we'll start out by asking, how long does it take to create a puppet and what are they made of? Yes, the, the puppets, I mean, the production took three years and uh, to work from the writing to the first <laughs> performance three years, um, it would took 12 weeks of uh, rehearsal uh, because uh, unlike any other uh, theater production that you can actually have a script, you come on stage, you write, you read, you know, just do and then change something there. And then you choreograph, this is not like that. You have to be very, very, very 100% prepared. You come on stage because almost there is very hard to um, make a decision right on the spot because everything is so technical and it has to happen before. The puppets build, oh, let me show you this. Uh, if I can, um, let me see. If it's, these are the puppets. Before pandemic, we made the puppet with one material. After pandemic, we made it with another material. So it's a combination of some kind of cardboards, which is very special. And, or this one of them is a, a, a kind of um, product called Siren. And then these are piece by piece. It's, um, let me see if I can have some white background here. Um, let me see what I have so you can see it actually. I don't know if you can see this stuff. Uh-huh, it's a bit better. Let's 
See, these are uh, these are some of the like the simple puppets that don't have that much mechanics. There are puppets that they have a lot of mechanics. But I can, I, you can see these are all one piece by piece is a paint uh, color gel. So uh, yeah, it's very tedious. On average, I would say on average, each puppet takes around 16 to you know, 16, 16 hours. Some puppets like those Akwan, those big monsters, those are like a, over a week of work. But some of the small ones, like uh, from design, cutting, putting colors, making mechanics, around 16 hours. So uh, yeah, it's it's like a like a making a movie, but you're also creating um, uh, everything, like creating even the characters. And it's like, you know, step motion animation is also the same way. But the good thing, the, the difference is step motion animation, you shoot, you make the all the puppets, mechanics, you animate them, you shoot them, and it goes finished, and then you have it, you can perform, you can uh, project it. But in this case, you have to build the show such a way that every night you can actually perform it live. So this is a very unique kind of, uh, production in that regard. Yeah. Second question. Great. Yeah. There is also the next question is that I read in the event description on the website for Song of the North that the story is reminiscent of the protests that are going on now in Iran. In what way? Oh, yes. Very, very good question. Um, let me start with this. Uh, I don't know, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know any other epic traditions and mythological uh, sort of books that still is in conversation with its own people. Like even if something happened in the, I don't know, Finland or Norway, nobody connected the North mythology. Or if something happened to Greece, nobody talked about the Zeus and the Pegasus and Hara. I mean, like these are like just remain in that category of mythology and but Shahnameh still is in conversation with its own people uh, which is really quite fascinating that this text after all these millennials uh, still uh, is in conversation for instance the uh, this tradition of cutting hair this is kept preserved in this book. So now you can see people doing it. Many mythological uh, the, uh, characters like Zahok or Feridun, or uh, these are, which is uh, like a villain in the story, they're associated with the current sort of situation in Iran. And also in this situation, in this particular show, you have a very strong female character that sort of stands against its traditions and he has a mass she has a master plan to unite the two Turanian and uh, she uh, gets a very big obstacle through his father uh, to her through her father and so she has to she rebels and she's basically almost sacrificed herself to reach uh, to what she believes is right our, our last production is the same, the Rudabe, which is very much Rudabe's character in the story of Zeral and Rudabe, very much similar to the what's uh, the, the woman movement, women movement in Iran, because she's also stood up against uh, the uh, tradition. And uh, yeah, she was kind of rebellious. In this, in this show, she's not only rebellious, she's, a, she's a, like a, um, big time warriors, and and she does many sacrifices to basically uh, rescue her beloved from the predicament of her own making. So that's why I feel that uh, is is it's very similar. And uh, yeah, I mean, whoever you guys most likely probably haven't read Shahnameh. Uh, I don't know many of even Iranian they know about Shahnameh, but haven't read about it, but a lot of uh, strong female characters in the Shahnameh, and the Shahnameh is actually women are the mostly are hunters. You have not a single plot that the man goes after the uh, woman. Usually it's the vice versa. And uh, although I have to say in this particular story, because I want to create a story that's um, been uh, 
the, uh, um, appropriate for 21st century audience, I adopted the original the story to the what I think is sort of, I mean, my adaptations to make sure that the audience in 21st century uh, relate to it in terms of many plots. We can go on details on that, but yeah, that's, that's how it's related to it. Great, thank you. Now the next question is for for Ramin. Uh, where how does the process of coordinating the score and the action work? Yeah, actually, that was the hardest part, as because as I said, there are no actors that you can lock into. We only had a dialogue that was kind of uh, actually we started music even prior to the the, the final dialogue, so even that was shifting. And uh, so it's it's kind of work with uh, kind of uh, almost like writing a video game, music for a video game where you stack and you create a different level of intensity. And then you kind of have an option when you're getting closer to the end, which elements you're gonna extract and create a better dynamic in the score. But it's actually quite a quite an interesting process to do it. and. You, uh, it's like also they do the same thing in like in the Seti Soleil or those kind of a live action uh, acrobatic uh, scores where not everything ends up being at exactly at the same time. So you have to have moments that it's kind of give away or kind of you relax the music, but in a, with an intent of knowing that uh, you're just compensating for the actors to come back. Uh, so it's it's very different way of kind of writing parallel to the to the to the motion that you see. All right, and then one more me, uh, question about the score is like, what are some of the traditional instruments that you used in composing the score? So I uh, robab uh, lafta, which is a Turkish oud-like instrument, but it's um, it's uh, actually fretted. I uh, of course Pejman played tombak, daf. Uh, we had um, Azam uh, was the vocalist of the group. She does she did some Iranian stuff as well as some operatic elements in uh, in the show. Um, I played Kaman, which is a bowed instrument. It's a contemporary instrument, but it is uh, has a quarter tone and it's kind of has a very ethnic sound to it. So along with violin, cello, and lots of uh, electronic music to kind of build it up. Uh, rem remember that we actually recorded this during the pandemic. So there were a lot of challenges in terms of coordination with musicians and having them come into the studio and uh, dealing with all that that was going on now that we have forgotten. It <laughs> seems like many years ago. I know, yeah. <laughs> there is one question here, which is not is a very good question. What is the challenging for the actor to perform this unique way? Are they trained as a puppeteer? So the answer is uh, some of them were puppeteers and, um, and uh, some of them are like, um, some of them are just actors. So uh, the one who are some of the puppeteers, they learn to act, and some of the actors learn to puppeteer, puppeteering. So uh, it was it was challenging, but it's, the show is very fun, and the backstage we had a very good time. So uh, it was a very um, uh, kind of uh, educational process for all of us to going through. Um, to make sure the show works, yeah. So it was a challenging, and uh, I mean every part of this show is challenged. <laughs> Even right now, we wanted to uh, uh, book it is very challenging because the show in this uh, magnitude is so expensive. It's hard to actually find venues to bring the show because that's also very challenging. So yeah, we. Yeah. We we also have um, Soon Young had been asking if you've performed the show in Thailand or in Indonesia where puppets are such a big part of their cultural uh, tradition. We love to, we love to. But as I said again, because the show is very, we are 10 people and we have five pallets of equipment and sometimes it's complicated for us to travel. So especially after the pandemic, there is a lot of budget cuts. Um, 
like my last show, we perform in Taiwan, we perform in China, Poland, France, uh, you know, Canada. But now it's uh, whoever we talk to, they have a budget cut. So <laughs> if Sonia know someone in the government of Thailand, please invite us. <laughs> You're going to have a backstage, a backstage VIP seat. <laughs> I guarantee. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, we have one more chance for anybody to still pose a question to Hamid or to um, Ramin. And it, this was such a fascinating conversation and, and, and so great to see how it works and to get this opportunity to go behind the scenes. So thank you both so much for, for making that possible for us. And we cannot wait to see the show. Ah, yeah, here please. we go. We have a new question. What has been the reaction of the Persian community to the adaptation? Um, no reaction. I mean, I don't, uh, I haven't been uh, crucified by academia yet. <laughs> I might, <laughs> uh, but I, uh, you know, it's again. Uh, I think in order to uh, keep the myth and this epic tradition alive, you have to adopt it for the new uh, era. Otherwise, they're gonna die out and they, they're gonna sort of lose their uh, momentum. So you need to adopt these projects, adopt these stories for the. Uh, future generation even. Uh, and just remember also Ferdowsi didn't wrote these stories. The Ferdowsi collected these stories from what they had before and he brought it, it, it introduced in a different uh, uh, way of uh, telling the story, which is poetry. And he added his own zest into it to make it uh, basically immortalize it. So I think it's up to us to also do the same thing for the future generation. Actually, if I may add something to that, which is very important is that is whenever you work with a, with material that it is traditional or it has a long history, you also have to look at it from the perspective of when it was created. And if you look at it from that perspective, for example, there were a lot of patriarchal structure existing at the time. So that would naturally reflect itself and it would web it, uh, would be woven into the stories and to the arch of the, of, the of the story. So in order to be able to present that to a contemporary audience, both from the perspective of the music as well as the scenario, it is inevitable that you have to revise certain elements to make it more appealing and relevant to our time. Definitely. Yeah, the, the, yeah, these are very important. I think, especially we're living in the era that Iran uh, is always demonized. Uh, so we even, and sometimes politically justifyingly demonized, but culturally we have to bring up, because uh, you have to uh, know this, you know, all these, for instance, right now, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, you know, anywhere, they spend money on culture, especially in the West. During the Shah, before revolution, there was a lot of budget to spending money to promote Persian culture. After revolution, this budget cut out, and basically this, this kind of show, it's something that uh, the government in Iran are against of. So, we are basically presenting the culture and promoting a culture that the government, Islamic government in Iran dislike. So there is no budget for that. So it's up to us to make this project and push it forward with the help of the you know, world community to, uh, to, introduce, to, to remember the, the, you know, the birthplace of the civilization. We are right now as an Iranian, Persian, whatever you see, even in Wikipedia and everywhere you go, they treat us as a like a side characters of the history or the second, like a, you know, it's not the main character, but we, you know, there's a lot to talk about, but we were like a main character in the forming the civilization and history. And many things that is happening, like for instance, this the whole concept of the knighthood in West 
the whole concept of the, like a, creating the uh, empire in like a Roman, they're all modeled after Persians. And this is not the claim that people say, oh, everybody talking everything's Persian, but it's true, it is. Like the whole knighthood, the whole governing system, uh, even like when uh, Arab invasion after that, they went to Spain, they took the whole wealth of knowledge and intellect and art of Iranian to the Spain and they claim it as their own. But this, this is really because they were no, nobody was, there were no, uh, what do you call it, the ownership. Nobody was spending money to promote this culture and safeguard it. It always they fell down, fell off on the shoulder of the artist. Uh, and uh, we had to just single-handedly hold this flag and running it into our field uh, in every era. It's not just now, it's be even before that, like that. Even during the, the Ferdowsi was like that. I mean, the, she, he actually mentioned all these things in, into his uh, poetries. Once in a while, he actually, in the middle of a poem, he talks uh, to, the, to the reader and tells what he's going on and what he's thinking. And yeah, so anyway. This was great. Thank you so much. Uh, and we, we hope that we at World Music Institute can help you hold that flag and, yes. and celebrate you know, <laughs> Persian culture and, and the richness of it and, and the history. And we want to thank both of you, you know, Hamid and Loga Ramin, for, for your time, for, for your passion, for your knowledge, and for your artistry. And we cannot wait for March 24 through March 26. Everybody mark your calendars. Um, Song of the North will be at Symphony Space. We even will have a matinee so that you can bring your kids and we look forward to seeing everybody there alive. And thanks again for joining and for being a member of the WMI community. We really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Good night. Goodbye. Bye-bye.